Look, Anthony knows what time it is. Look, Anthony, Uh-oh. game of the century tonight, right? I was uh, asked this earlier, and I was like, you know, on a scale of like one to Kevin Durant coming back to Oklahoma City, like I'll give it a three. So game of the decade. How about decade? Okay. All right. Fine. 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 Game of the decade. <laughs> it's not game of the century, according to Anthony Slater, uh, but game of the decade. I'll take it. Um, because th- th- I believe, the, and Anthony, you can confirm this as you've been working hard on this with uh, Sam Mamick recently, the winner of tonight's game officially wins the trade. Is that how it works? Yes. They actually get awarded. You know how, like, we've seen these ri- college football rivalries lately, the Apple yep. Cup, whatever. Yeah, yeah. They get some type of trophy afterwards. Very they will good. get, like, a, some type of trophy presented at half court. It's very exciting. It'll be a beam. That's what we'll be getting. Uh, yeah, it we'll could be, be that. Getting. Uh, all kidding aside, we welcome in Anthony Slater of The Athletic, who did write a kind of revisiting the Halliburton Sabonis trade uh, with Sam Amick uh, that posted to The Athletic yesterday. Uh, and one thing that I was so happy you 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 pointed out was Sabonis's impact on the Kings offense. Um, it's, it's James and I were laughing. The Sabonis is often thought about as an afterthought when it comes to this trade because it's the Tyrese Halliburton trade, and then there's the Tyrese De'Aaron dynamic. And sometimes it takes someone like you to point out, no, Domas is really, really good, and here's what he's done for the Kings' offense so far. Really important, and I think you know, I'm not necessarily sure he came to the Kings thinking, hey, I'm going to play like you know a Draymond Green type offensive role. But with, with the way Mike Brown came in, he, he, he wants his bigs to be able to pass. That is Sabonis's really unique skill, right? I mean, he's right up there with Jokic and Draymond as far as, like, assists among big men. And the way he can dribble handoff, angle his screens, the uh, you know, just some of the creativity he has, you know, high post stuff. Like, that is, like, the lifeblood of this Kings offense. Most of their highlights you're seeing, it is, you know, different backdoor cuts. Or, you know, even if he's not directly getting the assist, the action is beginning with him. and you know, we must all examine why are the Kings the second best, now third best offense in the league. And I think Sabonis is like, you know, I mean, James, you're watching, but like a major reason that they're so good offensively. Yeah, I I know the first game he came to Sacramento, my son came to a game and he sat right down below us and there was some play early in the game where he made a pass and my son looked up to it looked up at me from the stand and said, oh my gosh, he's so good. And that's like until you he's one of those players that until you see him play every single game, you have no appreciation for what he does on the court. And it, it's kind of like we had the the joy of having DeMarcus Cousins here in Sacramento for six and a half years. And th- I'm not being facetious when I say that, like there were so many things that he did that were squirrely and, and loud and obnoxious. But if you just to watch a player that is as gifted as him on the court. Is something you just, if you don't get to see it, they hide in obscurity, like in places like Sacramento. And if they ever get themselves to a national stage where they can show that to other people, um, I, I just think like Sabonis fits into that mold. He's very special. And look at his career. He's played in OKC. He's played in Indiana and now in Sacramento. Like if he can get the Kings to the playoffs, I think he will be viewed in a completely different light than he is today. And again, he's like they joked around on the the Boston Celtics telecast, I guess, calling him like a broke man's uh, Jokic. He's not a broke man's Jokic. He's not Jokic, but he's about the closest thing in the league that you have to Jokic outside of Jokic himself, except for he's in much better shape. Uh, You know, he's physical. He's such a beast. And I think people overlook him. And I think it's really sad. Uh, He'll get his due, though. I think he'll get his due in the long run. Yeah, I also think, I mean, you made a key point within that, like, just making the playoffs. Like, he's, his, his mission and the franchise's mission is to make the playoffs, where I think sometimes in the modern, uh, you know, era, we get caught up in, like, how, could that guy survive in a Warrior Celtics NBA Finals? And it's like, you know what? You like, if Demonis Sabonis is playing in the West Finals this year for the Kings, like, he's probably against the Warriors will say he's probably getting picked on and pick and roll. And that's one of the stories on why the, you know, Warriors survived the series four one or something like that, because he was targeted on high screens, but it's like, you know, there's still regular season basketball and there's still like these, these nightly, um, I guess, uh, you know, again, they just are trying to make the playoffs. And I think he creates such a tough regular season offense to play against because he's unique the way he can pass and do stuff. Like he's not just going to get regularly, 
uh, you know, targeted on a nightly basis. So uh, I, I think he's probably will get some level of appreciation. But again, the objective is making the playoffs and still still late November. So we'll see. Um Tyrese will you you're talking about team objectives and that's 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 yeah. fantastic. Tyrese is absolutely going almost certainly going to be an all-star uh mm-hmm. this year given the way that he's played. You think Domas has a chance to be an all-star? Probably not cuz I think it's crowded in the west. I mean a chance sure, but like I think Fox is probably their all-star, right? I mean I think that's even he'll probably be marketed that way. Um, and I'm not sure we'll see because the, the, the standings are so crowded, but I'm not sure the Kings get to, um, so that's probably where he might be on the outside looking in, but that's a good point that I haven't thought of how, because they often factor like how many all-stars you get based on how many wins your team has at that point The it's so clustered yeah. in the Western conference that there's not going to be a lot of, probably not going to be a lot of separation between, you know, potentially two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe even all the way down to 10. Well, I think you even said it's later. It's November. You yeah. know, it's, it's almost December, but well, it's to be still, fair, it's November yeah. 30th. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got you. <laughs> well, I mean, we're, we're at the, like the, the 20 game mark of the season tonight. Yeah. And so what I mean by that is that, you know, when we get to game 50, we're going to have a much better idea. And, and this whole bunched up thing, it's not going to look the same, it, no. it, you know, like I, I think we'll see, a major separation between the top with the top 11 teams sort of taking off, but also like individual teams, like separating themselves from small packs. And and it's kind of the way it goes. But even right now you can start to see where, you know, there are teams that you thought would be there that are starting to climb slowly Mm -hmm. or, you know, jazz kind of dip in Portland dip in. Remember like three weeks ago, we're like, could this be the one two seed? I mean, I don't, I I hope nobody was saying that seriously, but um, (laughs) the, to me, if they're a if they're a surprising, let's say come January, you're right around real all star marketing time. If they're a four five seed, and you're like, man, the Kings are still like mid season, like in the four five, they could get two. You know, you could get two all stars in there. But if they're where I probably think they will be, which is right around more eight nine, I just think you're getting one, and I think you're already seeing the way the Kings are even talking. It's like Fox; they're really trying to pump Fox up to become a first time all star. Uh, Anthony, you wrote about uh, you and Sam Amick wrote about like the the Matherin, you know, the, the Matherin Tyrese conversation, I think, is is really fascinating. Benedict, Benedict Matherin has been incredible and the Pacers have been really, really good this year. Um, but you look at that and I think you framed it. That's the backcourt of the future. And I just walked away from it like, why is Benedict Matherin so different than Tyrese Halliburton and De'Aaron Fox? Yeah, I think Matherin is a more of like a a two like a, an off ball score like you know catch and shoot um he, although you know they've separated their minutes i think smartly carlisle's done that um uh, you know matherin runs the second unit you know i believe they're starting them hard um matherin still plays a ton but i think it's been purposeful like you know somewhat of a stagger with those two whereas you know when we get a year or two from now just like with halliburton by year two there will be more of a conversation when those guys have to both be starting and playing 36 minutes a night like Maybe there will be somewhat of, of a friction, but I do think Halliburton needs the ball to, to be his best. Fox needs the ball to be his best. I do think Matherin a little bit more can be just an off-ball sniper that can also do second-side action, second-side playmaking, but more of a true shooting guard than the other two. Uh, I'll also point out, too, like I think it's something that, that people sometimes miss, that, that Sabonis needs the ball a ton as well. But there's such a big difference between needing needing the ball uh, when you're a perimeter player and needing the ball when you're big and playing a, two, a big and a small playing off each other versus two smalls playing off each other. And I, I think that that's probably the biggest issue why I, I don't think that this, like the Fox and Halliburton tandem could have been elite. I mean, I think they could have been really, really good together. Defensively, I think they would have been a hot mess. But uh, but the fact that you're mixing like your bigs and I also like we were talking earlier, um, just look what how, how well Miles Turner's playing without Sabonis there. And I don't think it's a knock on Sabonis, I think, or or like this huge boon for uh, for Turner. It's the fact that all of a sudden Turner's able to do some of the things that he wasn't able to do when he had a gigantic big standing in the middle of the key. And so I, I think really the pairings match up really well. Like, I don't know that. 
Halliburton and Sabonis would be as good as Fox and Sabonis. And I don't think that Fox and Turner would be nearly as good as, you know, what we're seeing from Fox and Sabonis. Combinations matter. Five man. Com- you talk to any coach across the league. They obsess over like, how does this five man combination work? How does this three man combination work? And I mean, to your point again, like, you know, especially because I do think this is in the Mike Brown realm, the warriors of the last six years and what he learned from them. But it's like, you know, Step, let's just take Damian Lillard, for example, right? You would consider him, particularly over the last eight years, like, and maybe you would consider him a more elite player than Draymond Green. Steph Curry and Damian Lillard together in an offense would not work nearly like Steph Curry and Draymond Green work in an offense because of all the pet action and two man, big, small, you know, screens and, and, and high screen action. Whereas, like, Steph Curry and Damian Lillard would want to do kind of the same thing. And, this is probably, you know, a, I guess a lower level example of that. Uh, who are you more surprised by right now, Anthony? Are you more surprised by where the Kings are or more surprised by where the Pacers are? The Pacers because the Pacers, this wasn't supposed to be their, like, organizational objective, right? They were supposed to be, you know, screaming towards Wimbanyana. And, uh, you know, I think if the Lakers had been willing to, you know, put the second unprotected pick on the table preseason – Buddy Heald and Miles Turner might have been on the Lakers and they would have nothing really to show for it except for a bought out Russell Westbrook and a couple picks. So I just, you know, I guess in retrospect, you look at their team, you're like, you know, there's a lot of solid players there. Rick Carlisle's always going to coach a team up. Um, so I can see why they're good. But if you were just saying before the season, I would have believed the Kings were better because I think the Kings wanted, overall wanted to be better more than the Pacers did. Do you think the Pacers' overall objective has completely shifted mm. or do you think that we're still going to come back to that we're going to revisit whether turner whether buddy healed finish the season in in indiana yeah i think that's going to be like conversation either up until they're traded or up until the deadline and you know the pacers will have to make that choice and some some of that might be determined by how they play over the next month you know as december becomes january do they fall off a cliff a little bit are they sitting in, i mean even if they're sitting in the nine ten range that's historically where herb simon their owner has been fine with he he prefers relevancy over bottoming out and getting a great pick but you know we've all seen win we've all even seen scoot henderson like this is a great draft class even beyond win at some point some of these franchises need to look at themselves and be like is it worth you know trying to you know you're nine you can get up to seven you know best case you can win a first round series or is it better to, to bottom out and i think Indy the Pacers are in a good spot to bottom out a little bit but you know I'm sure you're gonna have Carlisle being like um you know we're competitive I'd I'd rather have these guys around or even like a Halliburton right you know he if you told him hey you could have Victor Wimbayana guaranteed next year maybe he'd agree to to this plan but I'm sure he's enjoying winning right now leading the league in assists like that's not gonna happen if Heald's gone if Turner's gone if they sell off did Steph travel last night I thought so yeah, yes, I love I love that he reacted like he did. He was really upset about it. Well, the funny thing is, so end of the third quarter on a two, there was 10 travels called in that game last night, by Oof. the way. I, like, I don't know if that was a record or not, but um, Steph did the same move at the end of the third quarter, you know, like the step back to his left and then he changed the pivot foot. They called the travel. Then he did the same thing. And then after the game, he's like, I did travel on the first one. I didn't think I did on the second one. It was a difference. I was like, you know. Again, I'm not a ref. I'm not Steph Curry. I'm like, I didn't really see the difference there. It reminded me of the hero non-call in Miami. Really, it's the exact same play. Yeah. The so exact same maybe play you know, like and the Mike Brown definitely made the uh, you know officials have to look at that a little bit tighter. Maybe that's part of the emphasis that went into that game because it was a travel fest in that game. That wasn't fun to watch. That wasn't fun no, to watch. It really wasn't. Hey, you brought up uh, Victor Wimbanyama. Uh, Wimbanyama. Um, is there, is there a player that like, I mean, there's no one who's ever been like him. Um, but is he the biggest, we were discussing this earlier. Is he the, the biggest star to come into the league since LeBron? Maybe. I mean, Odin Durant was like a big draft. Um, Zion, I thought Zion just from a marketing standpoint, Duke, how, you know, he was pretty big. Um, the exploding shoe in front of the president. Yeah, that was a pretty that big was great. <laughs> um, but I mean, he does look like. Oof. I would say since LeBron, he looks like unlike any player we've seen. Where you're like, this is like a one of one. 
Zion kind of was a one on one too. You're like this, like you know, linebacker who's running like a four four forty out there. Um, but he's in that realm that we're talking. And you, I know some people have argued best prospect since LeBron. I, I wasn't around. I feel like we talk about this dude like they talked about Lou Alcindor coming out of UCLA. <laughs> like this dude is going to change basketball forever. Yeah. Well, I mean, like that's what it was with LeBron. LeBron. I mean, they started playing his high school games when he's 16 on that's ESPN. True. Yeah. I mean, we started seeing this guy everywhere and it was like, oh, he's a can't miss. Uh, and he, he did surpass miss. the hype. Yeah. He, he, he completely has, surpassed. Yeah. The hype. He surpassed the hype. And I, I think like Victor has an opportunity to change the game, to change the way the game is played. And whether he lives up to that or not, we'll have to wait and see. But like, he's fun. Yeah, I would say the difference and why I would consider LeBron like a better prospect than Wimbanyana is he's more of a like it's like the physical tools are insane. And if it's all put together over the course, you know, if he stays healthy over the course of two decades, we all see that like it would be something we've never seen. But LeBron's like feel for the game at a high school level was like I'd never seen it. It it would look like a true like 25 year old like star small forward NBA small forward that was just dropped in a high school game. Like the way he could just like feel the like I just you could tell how advanced he was mentally beyond just the physical tools. And that's what I think as a prospect. Again, I was pretty young when it was happening, but I remember being like, this is I've never seen anything like this just from a mental standpoint. I think that's one of the most amazing things about LeBron, too, that I, it's, it's amazing to think that that stuff was 20 some odd years ago. And if you weren't around when people were talking about how great he was at 16 years old and how he was NBA ready at 17 years old, you might not have the same appreciation for what he's done in this career. When you talk about like setting the bar massively high and him just far surpassing that bar that they put in front of him is it's unlike anything I think we've ever if seen. If you weren't in Arco Arena the night that he debuted, right? I was there. That's big you fact. Were? Okay, good. I was there. Cunningham got his autograph that night accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great wow. story. Um, Sean I just got fired from Fox 40 because James <laughs> let that slip out. <laughs> I remember watching him, and my thought was he's Carl Malone that, that plays so far above the rim. And I didn't think that there was any way – that a, a human body could hold up at six, eight, like two seventy as a, as a rookie, as an 18 year old. I, I just don't know how he's been able to maintain his body because that's so much weight. He, he does carry like he's in an in incredible shape, but just the muscle mass that he carries, the weight that he carries as a player and to still have the leaping ability to still be able to do some of the things he does. It's just absolutely remarkable how his body's held up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Still, I mean, it's, Tom Brady like in the longevity for sure. It's remarkable how Anthony Slater uh, held up through this because it appears he was holding his microphone through the duration of this conversation. That's commitment, my man. We really appreciate when, it. When I'm talking, I'm holding it. I, I'm, for reasons that don't matter to you guys, I'm not at my normal location right now. So I don't have the, the mic stand, the mic setup. So when I'm talking, I'm holding it. And when you're talking, <laughs> it's down at my knee. It's heavy. <laughs> we appreciate you anthony we'll see you tonight man thank you for joining us all right